Well, welcome back, guys. And I do hope, as ever, you and your family are keeping well at this uh, challenging time. And maybe by the time you look at this video, um, you're all back in school. So we've been looking at magnetism in our first video. Then we looked at electromagnetism in the second video. And in this one, what we're going to do is take electromagnetism a little bit further and look at electromagnetic devices that are going to use electromagnetic effects, things like the motor and the loudspeaker. So we're going to kick off with how we can make a wire move in a magnetic field. So um, I've got a large magnet here and I'm going to take a wire and pass current through it and that current will create a magnetic field around the wire. Do you remember the circles around the wire, the right hand grip rule? But what happens if I put that magnetic field inside another magnetic field? So I'm going to cut to another video where I demonstrate that and that bit of physics is going to be using something called Fleming's left hand rule. We're going to look at the forces on conductors that carry currents in magnetic fields and that will get us part of the way to explaining how a motor and a loudspeaker work. Welcome back. And I've got a fun experiment for you today. It involves magnetism and it's one that when I show it to my pupils, they're always really amazed by what happens. So what we need for this experiment is three things and one slightly hidden ingredient. I've got a normal DC direct current lab power supply here. I've got a very strong magnet and I'll just get the piece of iron out of the middle of it. And I've got a piece of copper wire. Now, the first thing that is worth showing is that the copper wire isn't in any way magnetic. It isn't affected by the magnet. And I'm going to connect this copper wire directly to the DC power supply. I've got a loop of conductor here, and I'm just going to put it inside the big magnet. It's when you turn this on that something rather surprising happens. So... It's at this point you might want to pause the video and have a little discussion and a little think about what happens when I turn the power supply on. So, I hope you've had time to think about what might happen, so let's do the experiment. So I'm connected into the power supply and I'm going to turn the voltage up quite high with the power supply switched off and then all I'm going to do is just flick the power button on. Did you guess correctly that the wire would come flying out of the magnet? It's most surprising. So it's always fun so let's try that again. We're going to turn the voltage up to full on the power supply and then very quickly just flick the power switch on. Three, two, one, go. So if there's anything your parents remember from physics at school that they didn't understand and always got confused by, it was Fleming's left-hand rule. A way of showing with your fingers which way the wire should go. I mentioned that the wire flew upwards in our experiment but could actually be forced downwards. And it would be forced downwards if we turned the current around and had the current flowing in the opposite direction or swapped this magnet around and had the magnetic field due to this in the other direction. So here goes for Fleming's left-hand rule. It's the one we use when we talk about what happens when conductors get thrown around in a magnetic field with a current passing through them. It's the one we use to try and explain how motors work. So this is my left hand. And some of you might remember our fingers represented different directions of things that were happening in this experiment. I always remembered when I was at school, first finger is field. So there's the north on my magnet and there's the south. They're not labelled so you can see them, but I've got um, some writing on top of them. So first finger field from north to south. The positive of the power supply has the current coming round from me through the magnetic field and back to the power supply. So this finger is the current and my thumb, the thrust, is the direction that the conductor will be thrown upwards. 
So, first finger field, north to south, this finger current coming towards you guys, and thumb thrust upwards. So if I've got all of that right, all I need to do is turn on the power supply and switch on quickly, and out it goes in the direction I predicted. Good, well I hope you found that um, video on the uh, left hand rule useful. It's not an easy thing to remember, but you've got the idea that if you have magnetism going at one direction, current going at 90 degrees, there'll be a thrust or a force on the wire at 90 degrees to those two. And at GCSE it's typically up and down. So that's Fleming's left hand rule and very useful to explain how a motor works. I mean, one wire moving is sort of, if we can turn that to rotation, that will be our motor. What I wanna do quickly though, is just explain to you uh, the size of that force, how you would calculate that at GCSE, okay? And it depends upon three things. So if you've got a wire in a magnetic field, it will feel a force. How big is that force? Well, um, I will do this on the board as well, so you've got a written example. It depends on three things. Number one, what's the current in the wire? And that must be in amperes, in amps, okay? Secondly, what is the length of the wire in the magnetic field? And that must be in meters. So that's quite a short distance, okay? It's only, uh, so we say, one centimeter. So this would be in an exam, 0 0.01 meters. And the final thing it depends upon is how strong is this magnetic field. That complex idea, the magnetic flux density. Um, don't worry too much about that in detail, but it's basically how many field lines are going across this gap in a certain cross-sectional area. Okay, let's put all those ideas together. What does the force that a wire feels in a magnetic field depend upon? Turn up the amps, stronger force, turn up the current. Turn up the magnetic field, okay, uh, stronger force. Put more wire in, in other words, uh, make the wire longer or loop it around. So we've got twice the length in and we'll feel twice the force. And the equation for this, which I'll do on the board, is really easy. The force that the wire feels is those three things multiplied together. The force is the magnetic flux density B times by the current in the wire I times by the length of the wire in the magnetic field L. F equals B I L. Okay, so you could be asked for any of those in the equation um, to rearrange it at GCSE so you work out what the current is if you know uh, three of the other things, but F equals B I L. The force on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field is equal to the magnetic flux density B times the current flowing in the wire I times by the length of the wire in the magnetic field L. F equals B I L. So if we can get wires in a magnetic field to be forced upwards if the current goes one way and downwards if it goes the other way, then we can get one side to come up and one side to go down. And if it's on a little spindle, we can get some rotary motion. We can start to make a motor. So um, you need to understand how a motor is constructed and also how it works, the DC motor typically. And so I'm gonna cut to a couple of videos now to try and explain to you how you would build a motor, what the bits are inside a motor and how it works. How does it get to rotate when you pass current through a conductor in a magnetic field? So you might remember from a previous video of mine, we looked at Fleming's left-hand rule. We looked at forces on wires in magnetic fields. So a very quick recap here. If I take an electrical conductor and pass electricity through it. So I'm gonna connect it to the positive of the power supply and this end to the negative. We've got electricity coming towards you. Um, this is the north of the magnet and this is the south. So if we use Fleming's left-hand rule, we've got first finger field, there's the current and the wire should be thrust upwards. 
So, we need to understand this before we can explain how a DC motor works. So, got the current that will be coming towards you, magnetic field going across at 90 degrees. We'll turn the power supply full up and turn on and see what happens. Three, two, one, go. And there you go, you see the wire is thrust upwards at 90 degrees. So, power supply just tripping out there because of the large current. And also, the wire feels quite warm. That's um, another sign that there was a current flowing. But the important thing is, we got some motion. And we got a wire moving upwards. Well, if you think about it, if we turn the direction of current round, and instead of having the wire coming towards you, have it in a coil coming away from you as well, that side, with the current flowing in the opposite direction, will be pushed downwards. And if you think about it, if one wire is forced upwards and the other wire forced downwards, we're somewhere near to getting rotation, which is what we need for a DC motor. Right, so we now know what we need to make a DC motor. So, here's a little model uh, that we made a while ago, and this is a fully working DC motor. Think of the things that it needs. It needs a magnetic field. And so these two magnets provide the magnetic field and they must work across um, the coil that's in here. In other words, it must be north to south. You can't have a north pole facing a north pole on the other side. The next thing you need is some wire going through the magnetic field at 90 degrees and also through the magnetic field at 90 degrees in the opposite direction. So using Fleming's left hand rule, one set of wires will be pushed upwards, one set will be pushed downwards, and that, on a spindle, is what's going to cause this to rotate. But there are a few things we can do to make that rotation better, and we've got to solve the problem of, if this side is pushed upwards, how can we get it to be pushed downwards when it rotates through half a turn? So here we are with our DC motor. You remember the bits we need. We've got a magnetic field going across, wires in a coil going round and round. So one conductor set going this way and one going the other way. This one might be forced upwards if we connect it um, the right way around and this side will be forced downwards. And the end of these coils are connected on either side of this uh, shaft um, to what we call brushes. And the brushes touch on and they disconnect and reconnect and disconnect and reconnect on every half turn. So if I've got a positive wire here, it'll connect to this side and force this up, but then it'll disconnect from that side and now these wires will be touching the negative and it'll be forced down. It's quite a complicated thing and most students find it very difficult to understand. But the main thing is that the wires going in and out of the coils connect to the positive, get pushed up, connect to the negative, get pushed down. And as it rotates, there's that connect disconnect, which changes the direction of current and therefore changes the direction of the force from up to down and we get rotation. So we're just about there. Let me very quickly whiz through what we've got here. We've got a magnetic field at 90 degrees to a current. We've got some turns here, more correctly, it's one coil with lots of turns. And we've got two brushes, a positive and a negative one, acting on the uh, rotor, onto the commutator of the rotor. And the only thing that's not so good about this little motor is to get a bigger force, we need a stronger magnetic field. So you would normally wind these turns onto a soft iron core. But for this one, a wooden one works fine. So let's connect it up and see it working. Right, so a couple of wires to the power supply, so in we go here. We'll just make this side negative. I haven't done Fleming's left hand rule on this to see if it goes up or it goes down, but we'll find out soon. And we'll make the other brush always positive. So that will always push the wire on this side in the same direction. Uh, turn on the power supply and hopefully it'll start straight away. So here we go, turn up the current. Now it's stalled there because the wires aren't in the magnetic field, but let's get them into the magnetic field and there we go. Okay, turn the current down, turn the current up, 
So we get a greater force, turn the current down again, and finally turn the current off, and it stops. It stopped in a very interesting position because it's worth pointing out that the wire has to be in the magnetic field, and if it's out here, it's actually trying to move in the same direction as the magnetic field, and it's also rather outside it as well, so that motor will never get started. You'll probably find, actually, the brushes aren't touching at that angle. They're only connecting here. So let's very quickly see if I was right. Turn the current, or at least turn the voltage up and turn on straight away, and it should go straight away. And we've got some power control or torque control on our motor by changing the current flowing through the coil. I just wanted to be a bit more specific about why the motor won't start from the vertical position or why it can sometimes stall in that position like it did uh, a bit earlier on. If you remember, Fleming's left-hand rule has everything at 90 degrees. The magnetic field goes across, the current goes at 90 degrees to the magnetic field, and the force is felt on the rotor either up or down. So when the rotor's in this position, regardless of any other reason, we've got the magnetic field going across, that's fine. We've got the current going at 90 degrees, that's fine. But the force to be at 90 degrees on the rotor must be up or down. And of course that would have the effect of lifting or pushing the rotor downwards. So it's just not going to rotate when it's at this angle. So you might ask, well, how does it manage to keep going round and round then if there's no rotational force on it here? Well, once it's got going, its momentum carries it past that point and then it can feel a force, a component of force getting ever larger vertically and that can cause the rotor to keep rotating. So just before we finish, Here's a rotor out of uh, an electric drill. This is the real thing, not a model. Um, the stator, the case stays where it is. I hope you can see all the relevant bits. You can see the soft iron core, lots and lots of turns. And in fact, there are different coils at different angles to stop it from stalling. Here's where the brushes touch on the commutator. The brushes will be in the case and it's mounted on bearings so it can freely rotate. And why I brought this out uh, partly was to show you, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but there are some bits of metal missing from the heavy rotor. That should be the subject of another video, really. That's because you'll notice the shaking because it wasn't totally balanced on either side. One side's heavier than the other. So they cut out bits of metal where the rotor is a little bit too heavy to make both sides the same mass, and if that's the case, it won't shake a lot when you use it. It's dynamically balanced. So, you understand hopefully now how a motor works, not very easy. What I've got here is a loudspeaker. Um, you could sort of consider a loudspeaker as being a linear motor. You can see it going up and down. Okay, we'll just uh, take the teddy bear off and we'll go for a higher frequency um, so you know that quite loud, loudspeakers make sounds, okay? And I'll just turn the amplitude down on this. Um, and um, a pair of headphones would be one of this on, on this side and one of these on the other side uh, with a band over the top or a much smaller version of this um, in your ear, like those little um, earbud headphones. But if I put the loudspeaker on the desk like that, okay, uh, we've got connections to the back and I'll just turn the sound off because that's a, just so I can talk over it, okay? We've got a big magnet here and then uh, pushed inside that magnet and inside this holder is a paper cone, that bit there that we don't want to damage, okay? And wound on that paper cone at the back is a coil of wire, okay? Now, if you think about it, if we feed sound into this, that's AC, electricity that's going plus, minus, plus, minus, current forwards, current backwards, then if we put those wires inside a magnetic field, when the current's positive, they might be pushed one way, and because they're attached to the cone, they'll push the cone forwards, and when the current's in the opposite direction, negative, it might be pulled the other way, in other words, pushed inwards. So, we're getting a current in the coil. Remember we have a coil 
Okay, lots of turns, so the force is bigger. F equals B I L. The L is bigger. We have loud sound, uh, so we have lots of I, lots of amps. And we also get a good effect. We get a lot of force because we have a strong B magnetic flux density, a strong magnet. So to summarize in the loudspeaker, we've got a coil of wire with alternating current going into it. And that coil of wire is being pushed out of the magnetic field, then pulled the other way, then pushed out. And that's what causes the comb to go backwards and forwards and create a longitudinal pressure sound wave. So what I'm going to do now is head up to the board and try and put all the ideas together that we've done today. Okay, so I've come up to the board now and I'm going to go through all of the work we've done in the earlier bit of this video. So um, the first thing I'd like to look at is uh, Fleming's left hand rule. Uh, Fleming. Okay, um, they sometimes call this the left hand rule. Okay. Um, and it's used for uh, wires in magnetic fields that are going to move. It's a motor effect. Okay. Now, um, this is uh, quite tricky and it's quite tricky to draw, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, what you remember we had was a magnetic field going across a gap. And it's really important that you understand that the magnetic field that goes from north to south across the poles of a magnet um, is uniform. So I'll just draw the uh, pole pieces of the magnet here. It's the bit that always takes a while. Okay. And so you've got one side of the magnet there, the other side there, a sort of horseshoe magnet if you like. Okay. And let's make this side uh, the North Pole and this side the South Pole. So I won't draw them on just yet, but you've got magnetic field lines going straight across, straight across, straight across. A nice, even strength, uniform field. Everywhere in that gap, never mind if you're close to North or close to South or in between, will be the same strength of magnetic field. And what we're going to do is put our wire in this gap. So here's our conductor. Now, obviously, uh, that goes uh, you know, further away that way and comes towards me. It obviously has to be connected to um, a circuit. And then what I want to do is indicate that the electricity is coming towards us. So this is connected to the plus and that's connected to the minus. And do you remember that when electricity comes towards you, the dot, you see the dot. Yeah, that, to every physicist, makes them realise that they've got a current flowing towards you. And then the left-hand rule, um, this is a tricky one to remember, other than everything is at 90 degrees. Okay, uh, first finger is the uh, field, so that's that way. Okay, the current's coming towards me, field that way, current coming towards me, thumb points upwards. So the thrust on this wire the thrust on the wire, the force, will be upwards. Can you see how everything there is at 90 degrees to each other? Okay. Now, um, obviously if I turn the current around, the only thing that's changed is the direction of the current. So the current will go into the page and be across, and that wire would be forced downwards. Okay. And in the motor, we're going to have wires that are forced upwards and forced downwards. They're going to be in a magnetic field that we call the catapult field. Now it's a good time now just to very quickly notice that the permanent magnet has field lines going across, okay, across the page, and the wire has its own magnetic field. And do you remember the corkscrew rule or the, uh, uh, the right hand uh, grip rule? Okay, it will have magnetism going around the wire in circles. And what happens in this gap is the addition of those two magnetic fields. And it's the addition of those two fields that causes the wire to move. Okay, and it's that I want to um, look at in a few minutes. 
but what I'm going to do first is remind you how we'll calculate what is the force on that piece of wire in the magnetic field, F equals BIL. So let's calculate the force uh, that acts upon this wire in the uh, magnetic field. And you remember the equation was F equals B I little l. Okay, now um, I haven't really got time to write on what all of these are, but the force in Newtons, the magnetic flux density in Tesla, the strength of the magnetic field, I the current in amps, and L the length in meters. Okay, so um, let's suggest that we actually know how strong our magnet is. Okay, so let's say that the magnet we've got um, has a magnetic flux density of 0.1 Tesla. Okay, uh, nothing to do with the car, well, indirectly. Uh, Mr. Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, who um, did this work years and years ago, did a lot on electromagnetism, had a unit named after him, and so he should have done because he was a truly amazing inventor and individual. Okay, uh, let's have a current flowing through the wire. Uh, I'm suggesting quite a high current, uh, 4 amps, okay, and we need a high current because even though the magnetic flux density is high, the piece of wire in there is only one piece of wire, so it's very short, so let's have the length of the wire as 50 centimetres, okay, so I hope you're feeling uncomfortable about what I've done there, okay, we don't measure lengths equations in centimetres so that would be a typical trick so to work out the force on the wire it would be B 0.1 times 4 amps times metres 0.5 okay I've made the numbers really easy so 0.5 times 4 is 2 0.1 times 2 is 0.2 and then what I've done is I've calculated a force, so that will be a force in Newtons. And I look at that answer and go, yep, very much as expected. Okay, it's a reasonably strong magnetic field. It's a reasonably strong current, but it's a very short uh, piece of wire. It's only one piece of wire. So if we want a bigger force, it's hard to turn up the magnetic flux density. It's hard to get more current because the wires melt. So why don't we have a longer piece of wire in there. In other words, go round and round again and round again and round again. Have lots of individual pieces of wire, lots of turns sitting in that magnetic field, and then we'll multiply the force. And that's exactly what happens in a motor. Okay, I now want to show you using magnetic field lines why the wire is actually pushed upwards. And this is a really nice bit of physics called the catapult field. Um, it's, it is sort of GCSE, but it's quite tricky, so um, I don't want to overcomplicate on this one. Okay, so uh, the first thing is we're going to redraw this diagram, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to draw it looking that way. Okay, it's easier for me to draw um, in two dimensions, so we're just going to look at it sideways on. So uh, here we go. We've got the North Pole there and the South Pole here. I'm perhaps drawing it a little bit small, but you know, hear what I say and you'll kind of get the idea of how this works. So there's the north to south, okay, and then we're going to have the wire going between them, do you remember we're looking end on, so we've got the uh, wire travelling like that, and the current coming towards us, okay, so um, you can sort of see things at 90 degrees now, you can see the field going across, the current coming towards us, and the wire is going to be pushed up or down, using Fleming's left-hand rule, it's going to be pushed up. But let me show you how this works. It's really clever, okay? The first thing to notice is the magnetic field due to the magnet is straight across, straight across, straight across, straight across, okay? That's that sorted. Separately, do you remember the corkscrew rule? That this is a current coming towards us, so to unscrew a lid, unscrew a corkscrew, we have to turn anti-clockwise. Add those two mathematically, that's hard. So we just do it with drawing. And watch this for clever. A field line will come along here, okay, and then it experiences this twisting field, the one that goes around the uh, conductor, anti 
clockwise. So it kind of, instead of going up this way, or straight through it, it will follow it round and then disappear off to the south. Okay. Another field line here will come along from the magnet, go round with the wire's magnetic field and travel to the south. Now, I can't fit it on my diagram because um, it's a little bit small, but a field line coming along here will travel around with the wire's magnetic field and then go that way. Do you notice these field lines here? Okay. Uh, those field lines behave a little bit like rubber bands. Can you see why it's called a catapult field? So these field lines, uh, field lines try to straighten. That's not very good physics, but they try to straighten out. So they'll push that wire upwards. So this wire will experience a force that way. That's why the force is at 90 degrees. Now, it's a bit tricky, and I'm not going to draw it. There's my phone beeping, uh, Morse code. Okay, it's a bit tricky, but if the um, current goes into the page, okay, the magnetic field is going to go around the wire that way, okay, clockwise. So the field lines would come along, go round clockwise and in, come along, go round clockwise and in. In other words, it would be the diagram flipped over, so the wire would be pushed downwards. Well, that's interesting. If we can get one wire pushed upwards and one wire pushed downwards, because the currents are in opposite directions, then we'll begin to see maybe, if it's on a spindle, a bit of rotation. So, that's a starting look at how wires are pushed up out of magnetic fields, and it's the start of how a motor will work. So it's a bit complicated, but I couldn't resist the temptation to draw the diagram for the working motor, which we're going to explain in a second. Um, it's probably a good idea, it's good physics, to draw on the direction of magnetic fields, so always from north to south, so I'm now going to complicate these diagrams by putting arrows on the field lines. And I've drawn the one for a motor here. So that diagram is a wire with a current coming towards us, there's a wire with the current going away from us, so the catapult effect is on the other side. So um, I better draw the direction of field, though we do get a lot of arrows on this diagram if we're not careful. Okay. Now, let me see if I can explain this one. You're looking at it end on. Okay. Imagine a wire going into the page, coming around the back of my board, and then coming out again. Can you see that that's a single loop? So this one going into the page will be pushed downwards, Fleming's left-hand rule, or the catapult field. This one will be pushed upwards, and if we put them on a little spindle going into the page, they'll rotate. Okay, There's a bit of a problem with that, because when this rotates, it's always being pushed up, so it's gonna get, this one's going to get stuck here, and that one's going to get stuck there. Even if it overshoots, it's always going to be pushed up and down. So we need to do one other clever thing to make our motor work. Uh, I'll try and mention it. What we actually do is, as these wires come and rotate to here, we disconnect and we make that one the cross with the, wire, with the current going in, and we make this one the dot with the current going out. So once they reach this position, then this one is pushed up and that one is pushed down, and we get continuous rotation. Uh, I'll try and show you how that works. It's quite a tricky um, idea to get your um, head around. But what you can see here now is taking one wire moving linearly to wires that will cause rotation. And I'll just remind you that this is not two wires, this is one wire, but if we go into the board, round the back and out, it's one turn, but what if we go in, round, out, again and again and again and again? We've got loads of turns then, haven't we? We've got a coil, and because of BIL, B stays the same, I stays the same, but L will be much bigger. We've got more length of wire, so these forces will be much bigger. Okay? Um, these two forces are equal and opposite. Okay? So really that should be F and this should be minus F. But you'll notice they don't act on that point. So this one is away from that point. So there's a moment, there's some leverage here. Okay? Um, it's off this bit of the syllabus. I don't know if it would come up but the moment of this force is this force times that distance. But it's going to feel twice that moment, because we've also got a lifting effect here, so that force times 
that distance and you'd add the two together. I think perhaps going into moments now is pushing it a little bit. But I think some of you will see how this bit of the syllabus becomes synoptic, how all the ideas sort of that you've learned add up. Anyway, complicated diagram, but you see the catapult field here causing a coil in a magnetic field with a current passing through it to rotate. And that is going to help us build a motor. So I've taken a little bit of time to draw a diagram of a working motor. And yes, it gets a bit scary at this stage, trying to understand where all these bits are. But look, here's the north pole of the horseshoe magnet. Here's the south pole. Here's a wire going into the page, around in a single turn and back out again. Perhaps imagine it going around and around and around and around a few times to create a few more turns. Current going into the page, you know those wires are forced downwards. Current coming out of the page, you know those forces on the wire are upwards. So the effect will be to rotate this coil. Okay. So you can see how that will create a motor that will flip upwards like that, and then it will get stuck, unfortunately, because this wire is constantly being pushed up, and that wire is being pushed downwards. Okay, so I'm going to uh, modify my diagram slightly and draw some contacts on here. Little contact there and little contact there. Okay, so the electricity will come in through those contacts. Obviously, it'll come in through this one, around, and out of that one, and they touch against those bare ends of the wire. Those are the brushes on this bit that we call the commutator. And if we connect that to a battery, okay, I hope you can see which way around I've connected the battery, plus all the way around to minus. So the current will be, as I've drawn on the diagram, the current will be that way. Okay, uh, here's the final tricky bit. Okay, the current always comes into this wire on this side and it gets pushed down. Okay, and the current comes out of this wire and this one gets pushed up. But this one is now going to flip over on the rotation and now this bit of the wire is going to touch here and be pushed down. Um, <laughs> have I explained that? I'm not sure. Okay, it's quite tricky. But you can imagine that this wire that was pushed up is going to turn over and now touch this contact, have current the other way in it, and get pushed down. And so this connection, disconnection, connection, disconnection is what causes the motor to rotate. You will notice, though, that with this DC motor, one thing happens if the coil was to turn up at 90 degrees. Okay, That's then going to disconnect, that's going to disconnect, so the motor won't work. So it relies on a little bit of momentum to flick round and to keep going. Okay, so they work quite well at high speeds, these. At low speeds, they can stall and get stuck at the top. And there are other things we do to uh, make the motor more effective at low speeds. Anyway, complicated diagram. Well, it's close to the end of the GCSE course. But I hope you can get some idea of how the motor works from what I've drawn there. So let's finally look at the loudspeaker and it's going to be a little bit small drawn on here but what I'm trying to do is get everything on uh, one page. So um, the design of the loudspeaker. Well firstly you have a magnet and it's quite an interesting magnetic shape. It has uh, in cross section a shape uh, like a big capital E. Okay it took me a while to draw this but just bear with me. Okay, now, um, it's tricky to visualise this, but um, it's actually um, like a, a pole stuck in the middle of a can. So this is, uh, goes all the way around in a sort of circular shape, and there's a pole there, and the other pole is sort of wrapped around it. Um, the de I can draw it in three dimensions, but the details aren't um, all that important. But um, it means that basically, uh, in a ring around the outside, you've got the North Pole maybe, and in the centre you've got the South Pole. Um, there's one clever way I can do that. You could imagine a horseshoe magnet, okay, with uh, north and south, 
and imagine taking that and rotating it all the way around. So you've got the North Pole all the way around the outside and the South Pole in the middle. Not sure, <laughs> not sure if that helped you, but, uh, but anyway. So uh, here's the North. Uh, here's the um, North that's gone all the way around. And in the middle, here's the South Pole. So that's the back of the loudspeaker, the big chunky magnet on the back. Okay. And then what you put inside that uh, is the cone of the loudspeaker. So if you remember, a loudspeaker has this sort of shape sideways on. Okay. I'll draw that bit in three dimensions just to give you an idea of there's the cone of the loudspeaker. Uh, so you kind of put your head here and you listen to this part as this moves in and out. Okay. Um, this bit here will be a sort of uh, tube that sits inside the magnet. And what we do is we wind wires around that bit of the tube. So it'll look like this. A wire will come in, go around, around the back, around, 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 etc. And out again. Okay. And to these terminals here is where we connect our music. I'll put a little wiggly line there to show that it's AC. So it's a sound wave doing interesting things. Electrically, when I say a sound wave, it's an electrical wave representing a sound wave, and it varies in the same way as the pressure wave does with sound. Okay? So um, think about it. If the electricity goes into the coil one way, it might get pulled inwards. But if the electricity goes out of the coil that way, it might get pushed outwards. So this will go be attracted in, pushed out, a bit like the uh, motor with one bit being pushed up and one bit being pushed down. The coil of wire will magnetise such that it will either be pulled in or pushed out. And if we go positive, negative, positive, negative, it will go in, out, in and out. So the cone will push large chunks of air backwards and forwards. Okay, it will create a longitudinal wave. Okay. Now, um, the real detail of loudspeaker is quite tricky to see, um, but um, some of you might worry, probably won't, but some of you might worry about how can that bit of the wire be pushed out at the same time as this bit? Okay. Electricity might be coming towards us here, and it's north down to south. Electricity is going away from us there, but it's now south to north. So we've not only swapped the direction of the current, we've also swapped the direction of the magnetic field. So this bit here does the same as that bit. Okay. Uh, I'll draw it a little bit more three-dimensional there, so you can see the sort of um, circular shape of the coil that sits in the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, and that's the loudspeaker, really. I'm now probably going to mess up my diagram by uh, saying, obviously, the cone would kind of flop out and sort of fall, it'll probably get blasted out and stay out. Okay, we need to hold it there and let it move. So the whole thing sits within some kind of a case. You can see what I mean by it messing up my diagram. And there's a little spring there and a little spring there. Uh, so I really didn't want to draw that, but never mind. Okay, so this is the whole structure of the. Uh, the loudspeaker with the magnet at the back and the cone held with little springs so the cone can move in and out it doesn't fall out of the system even if you point it downwards okay um, but the main thing about um, the loudspeaker or headphones if you've got one on either side of your head is it's kind of a linear motor summarize fj yeah you've got a current passing through this coil that coil has a magnetic field due to the current passing through it that magnetic field is repelled by this one, by Fleming's left-hand rule, and so it'll either be repelled that way or repelled that way. And so a changing plus and minus current, current changing direction, will change the force either outwards or inwards and cause the loudspeaker to vibrate. Now there's only one thing you can change here. Put in more current, a higher amplitude of current, and you'll move the cone further. In other words, you've turned up the volume, you've got louder sound. So I hope you found that video useful. Um, electromagnetism and particularly electromagnetic devices, things that use electromagnetic effects, uh, typically the motor, 
and the loudspeaker. It's not an easy topic. It's not an easy one to draw uh, on the board or in your notes. So please do look at what other people have done, particularly in the textbook. And you've got some really nice three-dimensional drawings there. Um, I think that's us done for this bit of the electromagnetism course. So I do hope you found that video useful and I look forward to seeing you again before too long.